But he was like, B, I want you to lay down with me. And so I lay down with him, and I don't know, it was just like, he was like my little brother. And I remember when I had to leave George after 10 days, I cried so much. I don't think I, uh, I don't think I've cried that much since. <laughs> and the irony of that day was I told my mission team, nobody can cry. <laughs> I told my mission team, nobody should cry. Um, Why well, I had to leave him, and, you know, I had to, but I didn't want to, you know. Sometimes when you go on mission trips, like, you just don't want to leave. You really don't. And I hated it going back home. But I realize now in retrospect that leaving George left a deeper impact on my life than remaining with him. That by leaving him and having the memories that I have with him, it has left a deeper and more permanent impact than it would have been if I stayed with him. And that's what Jesus is somewhat talking about in a foggy way. Jesus says that I have to leave. Because when I leave, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit will come and He will make His home in you. He will make His home in you. Not only will He make His home in you, because He lives within you, you will do greater works than me. Now first of all, the idea that God lives in us is unfathomable. It's like trying to fill the ocean in a small soda can. Imagine if I went to the ocean with a soda can or or 16-ounce bottle, and I tried to fill the ocean in this little can or bottle. You would say, I'm nuts. You would say, I'm stupid. You would say, I'm insensible. But that is like God living in us. The ocean in 16-ounce bottle. Jesus Christ living in me is the hope of glory. That I can find victory in this world through fortune and misfortune, sickness and health, good and bad days, I can have victory because the one who lives in me is greater than this world and has already conquered it by the resurrection. Jesus also said, as I, excuse me, um, mentioned that when the Holy Spirit comes, He would empower us to do things that we could only dream of doing, of loving enemies, of forgiving the unforgivable, of extending our hand and healing the wounded. Jesus was concerned about our purpose in life. See, my friends, we're goal-oriented in this culture. See, goals are what you do. Purpose is who you are. Goals are what you do. Once you accomplish them, it's over, and you move to the next goal. But purpose is who you are. I will always have purpose in my life because the Holy Spirit lives within me. And that is precisely why Jesus said that he who lives in you will do greater things through you than even I could on earth. Let me give you an example. And this is a very logical, mathematical example of why Jesus said that I have to leave because when the Holy Spirit comes and indwells within you, you will do even greater things than me. You know why he was able to say that? Last time I checked my math, even if Jesus was still here today, he's just one person. When Jesus walked this earth, he was not omnipresent, which means everywhere at the same time. He was limited because he was, yes, divine, but he was also human. So think about it for a second. Would you rather have an earth with one Jesus Christ walking around or millions?
And that is why Jesus said that through the church, through us, that we can do greater things than even Jesus could do in his three years of ministry. You know, he only ministered for three years. The first 30 years, he did not minister. He did not serve. For three years, of course we can do greater things than he can. Not because we are greater, because the one living within us, we are all duplicates. We are all Christ-like. And so it would be only logical that we can do greater things on this earth together as a church than he could as a singular individual. And you know what else? Whenever Jesus healed somebody, like a blind man, whenever Jesus healed, I'm sorry, raised someone from the dead, such as Lazarus, I don't mean to be comical, but can I tell you something? After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he died again. (laughs) He died again. After the guy that was blind was healed of his blindness and received sight, guess what? Another illness came that killed him. All of Jesus' miracles, in a sense, were temporary. They were fleeting, vaporized. But he says, this miracle, God living in you, will be my permanent stamp of salvation. It will be my deposit. Anyone who has bought a car or bought a laptop or put something on layaway, you know that when you buy something, you got to put a deposit, right, right? you got to put a deposit so that they know you're coming back. If you don't put a deposit down, they don't know if you're coming back. And Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit is my deposit in your life. And it is my promise, I swear by my name, that I will come back for you. I will come back for you. And while I am gone, I will make a home for you. A home that you can spend with me forever. A home unlike this one. How precious are his promises. Some of us, we are unsure of our salvation. We are unsure of our faith because we cannot feel the deposit in our lives. And I am not questioning your salvation, but we are unwilling to surrender to the spirit that lives within us. Instead, we live by the flesh. We live by these lustful impulses rather than submit to the spirit that wants to reign and propel us into love and peace and reconciliation. You know, this past week, I was able to do a lot of ministry because I spoke at back-to-back retreats. And I spoke to one young, actually, I spoke to two young girls. Actually, they're your age. They're not that young. And they told me a lot about what was going on in their lives. I spoke to one young girl who was a month removed from trying to commit suicide. It had only been 30 days since she tried to commit suicide. And as I listened to her story, I, w- I wept with her. And she said to me, Pastor Byung, I have not felt anything for a very long time. I have felt numb for countless amount of days. But she said, when you prayed for me last night, I felt something again. I felt God moving in me like never before, like it used to be. Another young lady that I met asked me before I left, can I please speak to you, Pastor Bell? I said, sure, of course. I took her aside, and we began to chat. And I could tell she was having a hard time getting whatever it was off her chest. 